I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Journey Church. We're glad you're here. Today is the wrap-up to our Malachi sermon series. All of the sermons are now available via audio podcast. The videos will be uploaded very soon. So if you had to miss a Sunday, then you're more than welcome to go to our church website and hear the audios for now, and the videos will be uploaded very soon. That said, on our next slide, you will see the title of our sermon series, What Really Matters to God in Malachi. What Really Matters to God in in Malachi. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title, Believers Are to Distinguish Between the Righteous and the Wicked. Believers are to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. And we'll be in Malachi chapter 3, 16 through 18, and also chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. So if you would, please open your Bibles to the book of Malachi, starting in chapter 3, verse 16. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, we have the passage up on the screens for you. Over the last several weeks, we have learned that the priests who were serving the Lord were not serving Him in love, honor, and reverence. Therefore, the priests who served the Lord were about to be disciplined by the Lord. We also learned that not only did the priests back then in Malachi, in the Old Testament, but that pastors and preachers in the New Testament and today are also disciplined when we do not serve the Lord in love, honor and reverence. Next, we learned that the Lord was grieved and worried by the way the believers were treating their brothers and sisters in the Lord. It grieved, it wearied his heart. Next, we learned how the Lord was wearied by the ways that husbands and wives were treating each other treacherously with one another. And God said, I hate divorce. Therefore, God wanted all the divorces to stop. Next, we learned that the Lord was calling his people in Malachi's day to return to him we also learned that the Lord is also calling His people today in order to return to Him. But in order for believers to return to Him, we saw in the previous chapters that purification of their individual lives and marriages and families and congregations was needed. Next, as part of believers being able to return to God, God revealed to His people that they were robbing Him of His rightful tithes and offerings. And today, the final day of our Malachi sermon series, we find that the Lord ends his words in this book of the Bible with this focus, that believers are to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. That said, let's now read in Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 16, and we'll read all the way to the end of chapter 4. And I'll be reading out of the NASB version. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention to and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Now, here's our key verse for today in verse 18. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Now moving into chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. 
Now let's approach today's passage from the end of the verses in chapter 4 and start working our way backwards up through the text through the first part of chapter 3. I think this is going to help us to see these passages more clearly. That said, something very helpful for us to know about this passage of Scripture is to realize that the book of Malachi was written much earlier than where we see it placed in our Bible. We imagine that it was written at the very end of the Old Testament, mainly because that's where we find the book of Malachi in our Bibles. But actually, the book of Malachi was written back in the time around Esther. So if you do not already have one, I encourage you to purchase a chronological Bible for your study and for a resource tool. A chronological Bible is the exact same Bible that you currently have. The only difference is it's laid out from Gen Genesis to Revelations in the exact date order that the events occurred. So therefore, in this case, we find that the book of Malachi is coinciding with the book of Ezra when Ezra is instructing God's people. And this time frame was around 586 B.C. to around 332 B.C. So that is why chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, talk about God sending Elijah to his people. If we didn't know this, then it would seem very odd to us for the Lord to be sending Elijah, the prophet, to his people after Elijah has already come and gone. That's why you need to know where the book of Malachi really is in the linear timeline of God's word. So let's listen again to chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. And like I said earlier, we're going to start moving our way backwards up to chapter 3 at the very beginning. So, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children... And the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. The Lord is speaking metaphorically here in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. To see the realization of this metaphor in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, we need to now read in Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself, meaning John the Baptist, is Elijah who was to come. And also in Luke chapter 1 verses 11 through 17, this explains what John the Baptist will be doing, exactly what was prophesied by the Lord in Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. In Luke chapter 1, 11 through 17, in the NASB, it reads, verse 11, And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. Now we come to know this John later as John the Baptist. Continuing on in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Verse 16, and he, meaning John the Baptist, will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Verse 17, it is he, meaning John the Baptist, who will go as a forerunner before him, meaning Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now that we know this, let's keep working our way back up to toward chapter 3. In chapter 4, verse 4, the Lord says this, verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Now what did the Lord command Moses back on the mountain in Horeb? It was the Ten Commandments. God was telling his people years later that they needed to remember the Ten Commandments. Why? 
Well, very simply, because most of them had forgotten them. They were not living by the Ten Commandments the way God had commanded. And the Lord was telling His people in the book of Malachi to return to Him. And the Lord had been telling His people that they needed to return to Him. But then we end up with a book of the Bible that really lays out that we are, in fact, to return to Him. And by remembering and once again start following God by living out the Ten Commandments daily. Have God's people today also wandered away from him? Of course we have. What is one thing that we can do in our day and time in the 21st century in order to return to our Lord? Well, just like the people in that day, we too can remember and also follow God's Ten Commandments. In case you have not studied the Ten Commandments in quite a while, let's recap them here today. We find the Ten Commandments back in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 17, and I'll be reading them to you out of the NASB version. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, meaning the sin, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. If you'll remember, Jesus and James talked about a couple of these verses in even more depth in the New Testament. They told us that we were not to just murder, not murder physically, but also to not murder someone with our tongues. They also told us that we were not to commit adultery, not just physically, but to not even look upon another person with lust in our eyes and lust in our hearts because lust in our hearts already is committing adultery. This week, it may do your heart and your Christian life a lot of good to go back in the scriptures to Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 17, and just kind of go back through and study and read the Ten Commandments and see where the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and your mind of where you might need to return to the Lord. It might surprise you that a lot of times Christians really do stray from the Ten Commandments more than you might possibly imagine. Oh, I know a lot of times we amen the Ten Commandments. But then if you kind of sit there and you kind of work your way through, you're like, oh, well, I guess I could do a better job of following the Lord's will and that commandment. Does it matter how believers are living around you? Of course it matters. Remember the focus of our sermon title is straight out of chapter 3, verse 18. Believers are to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Did you ever know that? Is that you need to have God's wisdom. We call it discernment. You need to have some discernment about you, about the people that are around you. Can you discern people that are living righteously? And can you discern people living wickedly? You need to be able to know this so that you can make wise decisions. First of all, you need to begin with your own life. If you're going to start looking around and trying to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, who should you start with? Your neighbor? Or should you start with you? Start looking at your own life. Am I living righteously or am I living wickedly? 
And then we need to be able to have the wisdom to discern what's going on in the lives of other people around us. Now moving backwards even more through our passage, we'll come to chapter 4, verse 2. But for you who fear my name, that's key. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you shall go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You know, I grew up in the country. And I had the pleasure of raising livestock. And uh, we raised horses and we raised cattle. And I can still remember watching our young calves after they were born being let out of our stalls. They were running and skipping about in the pasture. And it was just truly a sight to watch. It would even have you chuckling. It was just a wonderful sight. They would run and kick and jump and twist and run and sprint. Then stop and kick and jump. They were just so light, so happy, so frisky that they were just let out of their stall. They were set free. They were able to live just free. Well, that is what the Lord is saying a believer in him is like. A believer who fears his name, who has returned to him, that person has turned from their sin and toward righteousness, and they skip about like calves being released from the stall. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that the way your Christian life is? Is that you are leaping about like a calf that's been released from the stall? Or are you worried? You're stressed. You're anxious. You're hurt. You're down. You're angry. You're depressed. And the Holy Spirit opens the door of your stall and you just stand there. That's what I see in a lot of Christians' lives. When we've been let out of that stall, we ought to be like those young calves that just run and jump and kick and, and just kind of sprint and, and just, we're free. We're free in Him. And that's what God says a believer would be like. Now let's move back into chapter 3 a little bit further. On our next slide, you'll see our key verse for today's message. And what I've done on the slide to be able to help you out a little bit is we're going to talk through some of this. So I just thought maybe I'd come out here and let's just all look at the scripture together up on the screens. So let's look at this. Malachi 3.18. So you, meaning the believer, so you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Did you know that God's will for a believer is for you to have the godly wisdom and discernment and insight to be able to distinguish between a righteous person and a wicked person. Now watch. And he goes on to further clarify what the righteous are like and what the wicked are like. And he says between one who serves God and one who doesn't serve God. Now really there's three types of people that you can come up with when you're looking at the screen. You have the righteous person who serves God. And then you have the wicked person who's not serving God. And then you have a righteous person who may not be serving God. Have you ever run across that third individual before? Maybe it's even your own life where you know that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet you're not serving him. You're not living for him in holiness. So see, we've got three different types of people here. Some people want to say, well, if you don't see any fruit in a person's life, they must not be saved. The Bible does not teach that. There are a lot of people that have been born again in the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel that are not bearing fruit and there is wickedness in their lives, right? So we've got the righteous person that serves God. We've got the wicked person who's not serving God. And we've got a righteous person who is supposed to be serving God, but sometimes living in a lot of wickedness. Okay, but you know, there's something else interesting in this passage. What else did I highlight? We highlighted the word again. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. You know what that indicates? At the present time, when the Lord spoke and this book was being written down, the believers in the day, the priests in the day, the marriages in the day could not discern, they could not distinguish between righteousness and wickedness. And let me just tell you something, church, that's a bad place for believers to be in. They were in such a condition in their day that as a believer in Yahweh, as a believer in the Lord Almighty, they could not distinguish between what was righteous and what was wicked. And what does that cause? You're going to be following people that are not living for God. Because you'll hear them talk. It'll sound okay to you. 
but your eyes are clouded, your ears are closed. You're not really getting that they're not living in righteousness. There was a period of time for God's people where they couldn't distinguish between the righteous person and the wicked person. Do you see that in our day to day? Have you been in conversations with other people you know to be believers and you can't believe what they're believing? You can't believe the people they're following. You can't believe what it is they're promoting on Facebook. You can't believe what they just said to you in person. You can't believe the activities that they involve themselves in when they leave worship. It's because we find ourselves in the 21st century a lot like these believers here. So before we judge them, we need to realize that we may have the same thing going on. Believers today not being able to distinguish between right and wrong. We're in that kind of day. So now we think the answer is going to be in government and getting the right person into our presidency and that will change our world. What we need to be able to do is to go to God and say, Lord, please help me to live more righteously. Wherever I'm living wicked as a believer, I need to change. Help me to change. Make me righteous. Make me holy. And then serve him out of holiness and righteousness. And Lord, uncloud my eyes. Unstop my ears. Help me to be able to distinguish again what it's like to know if I'm with a person that is a righteous person under Christ. And a person living wickedly against Christ. And help me to discern who's the believer that's really not living for Christ and help me to point them back toward their Lord. We need to ask God today to once again help us. The Christian church needs... I'm, a, I'm just really shocked. I'm really surprised at what the Christian church is believing in today. We are so far from our biblical roots. You know why? Because we're not staying here. This is truth. This is the plumb line. This is the foundation. This is absolutely inerrant and it will never change and God never backs up and there will never be something new. God is never going to add anything to this. This is our standard. And it has been since the days of old and also in the days of the New Testament. We have to get back here. Spiritual leaders have to go back to the Word of God and we need to get it right in the pulpit so that it gets right in the pew so that then you go get it right in the public. It's the pulpit to the pew to the public, right? So the problem starts here. So me and other preacher pastors, we need to make sure that we take a good long look at ourselves and say, are we living righteously? And let me tell you this. I've been in the ministry for 20 years now. And I know pastors and preachers that are not living righteously they are living wickedly and I've already given you in some of this sermon series in Malachi I've already given you this one statistic 60% of senior pastors are hung up on internet pornography daily sexual immorality here and that's a probably a low figure because if I was a pastor and I was going to fill out that questionnaire was I engaged in daily sexual immorality and pornography? I wouldn't want to say yes. I'm afraid that that would get back to my church family. So if 60% said yes, I think it's highly likely that that percentage might be 70 or 75% of senior pastors living in sexual immorality and pornography. So if we've got a problem with immorality and righteousness and wickedness here, what's going to be the case out here? But you know what we see? A lot of times, even under passage, pastors and preachers that are doing that, we still see a lot of church growth. But is in that righteous growth or is that membership growth or is that doing, building the church like a business? Did you know that you can grow the church like a business? Not as a spiritual building in Christ, right? So we need to make sure that we get the pulpit right. So the men, the pastors and the preachers today need to really look at their own lives and then they need to get that right in Christ before they look you in the eye on Sundays or Wednesdays and tell you how you need to live. But then once they have, and you have heard the truth, then you need to go live the truth. I was at a pastor's theologian's conference recently, and I remember one of the pastors there looked at me really funny when I said, man, I'm all about discipleship. He said, oh, that'll cost you. Membership 
can help grow your church. If you're going to try to disciple people, I have yet to find a pastor that told me that our church will grow if we're heavily into discipleship. I have not found a pastor yet in 20 years that said, if you really get involved deeply in, in discipleship, your church will grow numerically. It won't. We're not in that kind of generation. But I refuse to just be a church about membership. We're going to be a church about discipleship because that's what our great commission is. Is to go and make disciples of all nations. It didn't say go make members of all nations. Go make disciples of all nations. If people walked off from Jesus Christ who was the master teacher, master shepherd, I guarantee you they're going to walk off from me because they would tell him things like, well, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And it said many walked off. Do you think people today are more holy and righteous than they were in Jesus' day? To still hear the truth? you remember what Jesus said? He said, get prepared for it. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So I just need to realize that part of it is if you're going to try to make a disciple, some of them are not going to want to be discipled. But we are still responsible for the scriptures where it says believers distinguish between righteous people and their living and wicked people and their living. And what are we supposed to do? Go make a disciple. And let me tell you something. You start trying to get in the middle of somebody's business and they're living wickedly, they're not going to be happy. Don't expect warm fuzzies and hugs. Because that's not what you're going to get. And on top of that, did you know, and I've shared this with some of you before, that I have been more hurt in my life by Christians than I ever have been lost people that don't even know my Savior. That is just wrong. That is righteous people living wickedly. There's no reason for a Christian, for a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, for a believer in this God, to treat another one of God's children mean, unkind, unloving, or in a wicked way. It's not supposed to happen. So that's why... Malachi is such a big deal. Do you remember when Brother Ed Etheridge came to our church and did our revival? He said, I was shocked to find out that your pastor's in the middle of a sermon series in Malachi. That's brave. Why would a man that's been in the ministry for 43 years and has done revivals all of his life make that statement? Because he doesn't know a lot of other pastors today that are willing to open the Bible to Malachi and start preaching a New Testament generational church about how we need to return to the Lord. He said, I can't believe you do that. I remember Jack Graham saying this, and it's been a well-remembered counsel in my heart. If you're going to teach the Word of God, if you've been called to teach the Word of God and preach the Word of God, you teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. That means everything in between the covers of Genesis and Revelation. Malachi 3.18, one more time. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. Now, let's move back up to two more verses that are in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. Isn't that a great little verse? Doesn't that just bring joy and encouragement to your heart? Listen, then those who feared the Lord, are you a person? Are you a believer that fears the Lord? Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Isn't it great when you get with other like-minded believers and you're talking about over things of the Lord and you find yourself going, amen, amen, praise the, brother, uh, praise the Lord, brother, absolutely, amen. When you get in the presence of two or three other brothers and sisters who really believe in the truth and the word of God, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They talked, they chatted, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. So when you've got two or three believers getting together and you really fear the Lord and you're living righteously and you believe in the word of God and you start talking about it and you set your hearts and minds to live it and to help others know it and live it, the Lord will give attention. And hear your conversation. Isn't that awesome? And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. Verse 17, they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Isn't that great? God spares the righteous person. The one that fears him that esteems his name. What about the one that doesn't fear God and lives like they please? What about the one that's not esteeming his name but lives any way they please? He's not going to spare them.
At the end of the day, there are believers that fear the Lord and esteem his name. And there are believers that do not. And there are those believers who we know of in our personal life and sphere of influence that we need to love enough to go say, listen, I love you. You're not living for the Lord according to the scriptures. Is it not the person who says they fear the Lord and esteems his name? Isn't that the person that brings joy to the heart of the Lord? I'm sure you've heard this phrase, talk is cheap. Have you heard that phrase? All your life, talk is cheap. That's because talk is cheap. We can say anything. And you probably already know this phrase as well. Actions speak louder than words. When it comes to fearing the Lord and esteeming his name, living daily in holiness and righteousness, serving him in diligence, do your words match your actions? That is one of the most frustrating things for me in the ministry is that people tell me one thing and they do another. They tell me one thing and they do another. Their actions do not match their words. And if I think that bothers me, can you imagine how it bothers Almighty God? Believers need to keep sharp. And we need to pay close attention to those around us that claim to be believers in the Lord. Believers are to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. So, how does a believer, how does a Christian return to God? If you need to return to God yourself and you're realizing, hey, I'm a righteous person, but I've been living wickedly and I need to return to God. Or, I have a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker who I believe is a believer, but they need to turn and follow God. How do you do that? Well, a couple of Sundays ago, I wrote down nine steps and we had them up on the screens. I'm just going to verbally give them back to you now. You run straight to God. Run straight to God as fast as you can get into his presence. And when you get there, repent of your sins. And then resubmit to God because we all have times of walking away. You have to resubmit to his authority. Read God's word daily. Quit making excuses as to why you don't have time for a quiet time. You don't have time to not have a quiet time. Request God's help through prayer relinquish control to him resist the devil and he will flee from you rely on the Holy Spirit's power rest in his providence and grace did you know that a person that lives like that is blessed is blessed you can't live like this and not be blessed I'll say him again run straight to God repent of your sins resubmit to God read God's word daily Request God's help through prayer. Relinquish control to him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Rely on the Holy Spirit's power, not your own power. Rest in his providence and grace. On our next slide, you'll see a phrase that I hope will captivate your heart, your soul, your mind, and your attitude for the rest of your life. Your name is great. Back in Malachi chapter 1 in the first part of chapter 2, we see that the Lord kept pointing out the importance of his great name. The priests back in that day had forgotten just how great God's name was. They had stopped serving him in love and in honor and in reverence. Pastors and preachers today need to remember that God's name is still great and we need to return to him. The married couples in Malachi's day had forgotten just how great God's name was and hardened their hearts against him and lived treacherously with their spouses and started divorcing each other. Married couples today that call themselves believers need to soften their hardened hearts and reconcile with their spouses before our holy God. We need to fear the Lord and esteem his name by living this way. We all need to confess and repent and turn back to God and back to our spouses in love and honor and reverence. And as we learned last week, we need to get our tithes and our offerings right with the Lord. We need to stop robbing God today. Finally, as we have done the past several weeks in a row, I want you to now stand. And we're going to give God the love, the honor, and the reverence he rightly re deserves with our lips. Now, it's your responsibility to leave here today and not just speak it, but live it. The lips actions are occurring in this room. When you leave here, you need to live out in action what you have said. As you see on the screens, it says, your name is great. What I'm going to do is lead us into a period of time that we're going to say, your name is great. And you'll know when to stop. I'm going to stop us. 
but mean it in your heart when you say it because the Father and Jesus are in heaven right now watching this worship service and he knows your heart. He knows if you mean it. He knows if you're just saying it because the people next to you would think something's wrong with you if you didn't say it. You need to say it because you mean it in your heart. Your name is great. Your name is great. Your name is great. Your name is great. One more time. Your name is great. If we truly believe in our minds and our hearts that God's name is truly great, then would that not then lead us to love him, worship him, honor him, reverence him, and respect him deeper in a more real, rich, truthful, and extremely meaningful way? How could we say your name is great and then go out and live life as you did before today, sir? Our God is a great God with a great name. Hallelujah. Amen. His great name will be proclaimed and worshipped around the world. Do you remember the scriptures where God said, my name will be proclaimed throughout the entire earth. I want to be part of the proclaiming. It's going to happen whether I proclaim him or not. I want to be part of of the proclaiming of the great name of God. So let's lift up his great name today as we sing. This is going to be an invitation time. And then after the invitation time, then we're going to sing a song. And it's going to be by Natalie, Gray, Natalie Grant, your great name. So this invitation time is for you to get your life right with Christ. Please come.